an eighth special presentation. In this edition of Art Beat Nation, twisted metal turns shimmering works of art. It's easy to let that, that beauty of the surroundings come out in our artwork. A musician who has mastered a difficult combination. I love them both and the, the integration of them has made me a better musician. The very first poet laureate of the Navajo Nation. I think of poetry more as a way to preserve vignettes of life. And the artistry of Liberace's fabulous costumes. It was just a desire to just keep moving, to top what I had done before. It's all ahead on Art Beat Nation. Funding for Artbeat Nation is made possible by donations to Curate, the Arizona PBS Arts and Culture Fund, and by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you. In our first segment, glistening sheets of metal are transformed into whimsical pieces of art at the hands of sculptor Jason Lee Barnes. We catch up with Lee Barnes at his Florida workshop, where he creates sleek sculptures that mimic the underwater energy of marine life. Here's a look. We're a metal art and sculpting company that down in the Florida Keys. Uh, we make metal art out of aluminum. It's grinded to a beautiful shiny finish as you can see behind me. My friend Adam Welsh is actually the owner of the business and then I was lucky enough to join in right around the beginning of the company. When we started the company we originally focused a lot on fish um, because of the area we're in. We still do all the, all the beautiful fish of the world, actually, not just the Florida Keys. But we're also getting into more home decor type of stuff. Something for everybody, whereas before we were just trying to kind of catering to the fishermen of the Florida Keys. We have something for everybody, not just the fishermen now. So, you know, we have, a, we have $5 pieces of little fun, whimsical type of art for the kids. We enjoy making the art down here because our surroundings are so beautiful. It's easy to let that, that beauty of the surroundings come out in our artwork. We take pride that we live in the Florida Keys. I've been down here for almost 15 years. I as well came on vacation and never left. Once that design process is finished, we bring it here to our shop. We upload it into our computer. Um, the computer smooths out the lines, finishes out the edges. Then once we get that going, we start cutting. And what we use to cut is a, a CNC plasma torch. Now, as the torch is cutting, I'm controlling the up and the down on the torch. Um, the computer doesn't control all of the cutting. Um, a lot of the times, the, the metal, because of the heat, will get a lot of warpage in it. It'll pop, you know, pieces will pop up as it cuts. So we, we tend to sit here with our finger on the pause button and also the fingers on the up and down control button. Once we get it cut, we pull it off the table. We do a first stage of grinding where we clean up the back with a, with a handheld grinder with a five inch grinding pad on it. Um, once the back is clean, then we go, we flip that piece of art over and we um, proceed to grind the whole front of it nice and evenly. Now once that's done, we take that to another part of the shop and we use a Dremel tool with a diamond bit file on it. This cleans up all the inside and outside cuts. Any little burrs that might have been left, any rough edges, it kind of smooths out the rough edges on it. Um, really, uh, really takes it from a, a rough piece of metal to almost a finished piece of metal. Once the holes are all done and cleaned up, then we take it back to the table and we use a grinder with an 80 grit grinding pad on it and we do the finish grind where I go really slow and meticulous and 
follow the lines of the fish. And that's really where you get the nice, shiny, almost 3D um, type finish that we do called burnishing. The, the final stage of grinding really takes so long because we really have to look at that fish. We really want to be true to that fish. We don't want to just put some wavy lines on the sculpture and be done with it. We really want to pull that sculpture, you know, pull that grind to where it follows the lines of that sculpture. And then once that burnish is, in, is done, we take it and we give it a little bit of form. We bend out the, the fins and stuff like that so it kind of has a little action to it, a little pop off the wall. The trophies are kind of a whole different thing in themselves. Um, we do the trophies out of a little bit thicker metal than we normally do. Um, so there, that right there takes a little bit longer to cut it. And then we mount the trophies in the beautiful uh, red cedar wood bases. So that takes a little bit of time as well. You know, we do all our own chainsaw work. We, we sand the bases down. We polyurethane them, make them nice and shiny and beautiful. It's exciting for us to see like I said, that new design go from start to completion and then to see it hung up on, on whoever's wall and, and to see the smile on their face and you know, just to see the joy that, that our art brings to people is, is, is really good. If you'd like to learn more about these sculptures, check out designsbyfishbone.com. John Covelli has mastered the unique musical talent of both performing and conducting at the same time. Up next, this American pianist tells us about his musical passions and the evolution of his special talent. When I was four years old, I started playing the piano simply because I was drawn to it by imitating my talented sister who was playing music that my mother was teaching her. And when she left the piano, I would go up on the piano and play exactly what she did, only by ear, as they call it. I started conducting because I had this uh, anxiety when I was in my high school band and orchestra in one of the great schools in the Midwest in Chicago, and I wasn't happy with the conductor. I wound up conducting uh, my orchestra in high school, and I got this bug that said, uh, this, is, this is something I really would like to do. My first trip being asked to go to Moscow was, of course, very, very exciting. The whole idea of going to one of the great orchestras of the world, being able to perform in one of the great concert halls in Moscow, play with them as well as conduct them, was a great highlight. I want to be known for having tried and having accomplished as much in as many fields of music. I'm most proud of being a pianist and of a conductor, but I am so glad that I have been involved very heavily with the world of opera, chamber music, Broadway, ballet. Being a guest conductor, being involved with organizations as lofty as the Boston Pops and having spent a lot of my years in the world of popular symphonic music, all of this has enriched my life and I want to do more. The question always comes up, what do you like most, uh, playing the piano or conducting? And that's why I'm really proud of the fact that I was one of the, you might say one of the few as a pianist and as a conductor that combined the two. And so I have relished the fact that I can conduct a, a symphonic concert and then sit down at the piano and also play a concerto 
or some other work that's written for piano and orchestra and lead the orchestra while I'm playing the piano. So the answer to the question is very difficult because I love them both and the integration of them has made me a better musician. Why? Because once again, it involves working with and communicating with people. When you're at a piano and you're also leading an orchestra, you're communicating in what we call a chamber music style or mentality. You have to give, you have to take, you have to listen, listen very, very carefully. And, and so you're exercising every one of your faculties in music by doing both. Therefore, I love both conducting and, and performing as a pianist, and when I do them together, it's, it's a miracle. It's one of the great pleasures. You can learn more about Covelli at his website, johncovelli.com. In this segment, we meet the very first poet laureate of the Navajo Nation, Lucy Tapahanso, who shares how her poetry honors words. Here's Hakeem Bellamy with her very personal story. Lucy Tapahanso, it's a pleasure to have you in the studio today. Uh, I want to introduce you with your newest title and recognition amongst many as the inaugural poet laureate of the Navajo Nation and have you introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank this you. is the medallion. It shows the sacred mountains on this side. And then on this side is engraved with a picture, the tools um, that a woman uses traditionally in, in a contemporary sense as well. So, thank you. Yes. Yeah. So those are um, my clans and are important in that they're the ways in which I, I identify as a Navajo woman. A woman's tools, I really like that, mm -hmm. that phrase. And so uh, in your opinion, uh, trying to understand your motivation as an author, uh, how is poetry, and your poetry in particular, personally, how is that a woman's tool? I think that in Navajo, language and a Navajo culture. Poetry can be seen as a tool because we're a culture that was created by the sound of the word. Things that a person says, that a person literally utters, is a sacred thing. So I think that poetry is very much a tool of um, contemporary culture and really a tool that has been in existence since the beginning of Navajo time. Do you think that poetry for you has a, has a role in preserving language? Is that a motivation of yours? I think that in a certain sense it may. I think mm. of poetry more as a way to preserve vignettes of life. Poetry reflects the voices of um, a particular region. You brought a piece of work today. Could you kind of present the story behind sure. the poetry you're going to read? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd be happy to. It's about how Old Salt Woman created the first laugh ceremony for Navajo babies. When were you first taught the story of Old Salt Woman? I always knew about it because mm -hmm. every time a baby laughs now, people always tell that story. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know when I first heard it, but it's told every time that we have a first laugh. This is a sestina called Old Salt Woman. There's two words in here that um, are in Navajo. One is sani, which means salt, and then sasane, which means salt woman. Ilkeda jne, at the beginning of Navajo time, ashi sasane, journeyed to Herfano Mesa near the shallow river. They said first baby was healthy, but her cooing was not a song of joy or wonder. 
Since a baby does not know sorrow, O salt woman was called. They said that the colors of laughter of light efflorescence traveled with her. She who is the primordial mother of the salt clan. But her true essence became apparent in her autumn years. When Ashi, a son, was young, she found that the wondrous colors of betrothal can also contain hues of betrayal. Her pain was like a river of luminous beads worn smooth by tears and intense sorrow. Over time, she was able to transform the grief into exquisite songs of beauty. You can still hear traces of her sadness in the songs of doves on hot, still desert mornings. But that day at Herfano Mesa, her cheerful arrival made it clear that all such sorrows were in the past. Old salt woman held the baby, then put a bit of ashi into her mouth. Then she said, Wusha, Wusha, and a radiant river of baby laughter filled the Hagan. It was like the colors of early morning, of clear skies of salt, like the intense color of midnight. Thus the laughter of relatives eating together became a song for the first laugh meal. It was there, just above the San Juan River, that first baby first kicked and laughed. Everyone watched her, eyes glitter with happiness. Her small chubby hands pressed a she into each person's palm as they whispered wishes to her. In this way, sorrow would turn from our kinfolk. Ashi Asan's son remembered such sorrows, so she invoked the melodious names of mountains and the ageless colors of stones. She invoked the taste of fresh corn. Then the baby offered Ashi a box of cracker jacks and some fruit. These became the ritual songs that keep families together and loneliness away. Perhaps it was her radiant smile or tender baby touch in our palm that told us the crystal rivers of salt flow unseen beneath our feet. The hot sun and the thin brown rivers at the Netka remember the day when old salt woman arrived without sorrow. They watch as the baby became white shell girl. She emulated the colors of sharing, laughter, and the joy of stories. She was surrounded by her family and relatives, encircled by love. Today, her lilting songs guide us to old age. Like old salt woman, we cannot live without a she. Yes, it's true that a river of angry words can darken love's radiant colors, and one cannot say, I'm sorry in the ne. But careful words and old songs can recall the joy granted white shell girl who first blessed us with a she. So what makes you continue day after day to continue writing? It sounds like a cliche, but I really love it. It's as if I cannot not write. Mm -hmm. I, it's something I've been doing for so long. Mm -hmm. I'm always listening. I'm always observing what's going on. I like to um, honor people for the wonderful things they say and the caring things that they do for each other and the things that we can, that we often overlook on a daily basis. Tapa Hanso is the author of six collections of poetry and three children's books, and is the recipient of the Native Writers Circle of the Americas Lifetime Achievement Award. Finally, an up-close look at an exhibit of Liberace's famed costumes, and we hear from the superstar's wardrobe designer, the late Michael Travis, about what it was like to design for the famously fabulous performer.
My name is Jim Lapidus, and I am a costume designer. We're here to celebrate the costumes and the life of Liberace. I have a costume, it's the iconic piano key suit that I designed for Lee back in 1974. I am so thrilled the Cosmopolitan did this exhibit, and I am thrilled that they've honored Michael Travis, who is my mentor. Michael Travis, if you look at the embroiderer, he's like Picasso of beating. I did a couple of pieces for stage, but I was really primarily known for stuff that he would do personal appearances in. Michael Travis did the big show pieces that you've seen today and that Lee's known for. I made the classic Liberace look in the 17 years that I worked with him. It, it changed from a flashy, gaudy look to a really, if I say so myself, an inspirational, fabulous costume look, you know, with exquisite embroidery, with exquisite detail that had not been seen in his costumes ever before. I went over the top with what had been going on with his costumes. When I joined him in 1970, it was a hodgepodge. You know, anything for um, Flash. And when I was asked to do it, I was kind of, I don't know, you know, I mean, that kind of stuff. But when he said, you can do anything you want, I, and I tested him out, it was full speed ahead. Prior to him, I had done a show called Laughing on television, and then I was doing Tony Orlando and Dawn. And I was also doing Wayne Newton, I was doing The Supremes, I was doing Fifth Dimension, I was doing Dionne Warwick, and a few others. I was very thrilled for the break that it gave me. I mean, I was doing very nicely with Laughing and all of that, but this was just going over the top just being able to do what I wanted. Whose idea was the rhinestones? Oh, that had to be me. It was more than rhinestones. It was rhinestones, it was bugle beads, it was girls, it was gold filigree embroidery, it was all kinds of fancy, fancy type of embroidery. But the one over here, it's what I call the Napoleonic Austrian costume. The trademark of it is that when you opened it up, the whole thing flashed in an army of embroideries that looked like feathers. It was on the billboard here in Las Vegas. And, and the other one, there's a blue one. The suit and the coat are exquisite in every detail. I basically I studied fashion design in Paris. And I got exposed to a lot of the arts of classical design, of classical period costumes and all of that. And a lot of that was funneled into what I was doing with Lee. All in all, it was just a desire to just keep moving, to top what I had done before. And the fact that I knew that I had carte blanche, that nobody was gonna tell me, no, this is too much, or it's gonna to cost too much, was a reason to go one inch further. And finally, we came up with that $350,000 white box cape with an embroidered costume because he wanted it to look like my Lenny Dietrich. Nothing specifically guided me, you know. I'm, all I knew is that I liked elegance. As he said, his famous quote, too much is just wonderful, if you do it right. If you do it right. And these are examples of doing it right. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org slash artbeat, where you'll find feature videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation is made possible by donations to Curate, the Arizona PBS Arts and Culture Fund, and by contributions to AIT from viewers like you. Thank you.